Welcome to Central Church's online devotional ministry. These short devotions are intended to provide inspiration and hope to all people, including our friends, neighbors, and church members. We hope that you find them both meaningful and helpful as you search for spiritual food. It's our prayer that you discover new ways to serve Christ and be about His work in the world. Here's Pastor Bob. Hello. It's a very mild winter day, late December, in western Pennsylvania. The day of Christmas has come and gone. Our celebrations are over. As the poet Auden says, the trees are being taken down, the ornaments are being put away, and some of them are broken. Jesus was born in a moment in time. The Bible uses several different words for time, and one is chronological time, the Greek word chronos, the chronology, the clock, the calendar, ticking off the moments chronologically. And the other word is a word that is kairos, which means the right time, at the precise moment when it was right, the Son of God was born into the world. Let us read what the Apostle Paul says about the right time in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship, because we are his sons. God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. You are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. At the precise time, at the right time, sometime probably between the year 4 and 6 BC, Herod the Great, the king of Judah, died in 4 BC, so Jesus was born before the death of Herod. Into the history of this world, into human affairs, into our world and our lives came the Son of God. God erupted into human history with the Incarnation. Luke tells us at that time Caesar Augustus was the emperor in Rome. Herod the Great was the king in Judea, and those facts are noted in the New Testament. This was the right time for the Messiah to come. As far as God was concerned, that was the right moment. We are not able to say exactly why that was the right moment, but it was. Why not some other place? Why not some other time? Why in the village of Bethlehem, which was near the city of Jerusalem in the province of Judea, why was the Messiah not born in Rome, the eternal city, the seat of the empire, the place of power? Why was the Messiah not born in Athens, which was the intellectual center of the ancient world? Why was the Messiah not born in Jerusalem, the location of the temples? And why not at some other time? Why that time? Why not in London, 1900, the height of the British Empire? The sun never sets on the British Empire. Rule Britannia. Britannia rules the waves, as my great-grandmother taught me to sing when I was a little boy. Why not in New York in the 1950s, the very center of business and seemingly thinking itself as the center of the world? But at that time, Jesus was born. And the Bible tells us that Jesus will return. The time is coming when he will come back to this earth. Now, there are many apocalyptic fantasies, nightmares, and dreams that have been abroad in the world for a long time. In our time, the apocalyptic fantasies are often a very dystopian vision of the future. This is true in film, in TV programs, in writings, and in the popular imagination. An unending cavalcade of decline. The end will come by nuclear war, or by aliens, or by an asteroid hitting the Earth, or be brought by the communists, or the fascists. The stuff of science fiction has become a presence for all of us. Now, what is the response of Christians? Our Christians have engaged in eschatological speculations for a long time about the time of Jesus' return. For all of my life, since I became interested in these things, starting in the mid-1950s, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, I've heard predictions. Jesus is coming. He's coming in the 60s. 
He's coming before the end of the 70s. He's coming in the year 2000. He's coming in the year 2012. He's coming in the year 2023, according to some. That's a prediction that only has a couple of days to make itself come true. Now, these pre-millennial visions of the return of Christ, they sell a lot of books and people pay money to go to seminars, uh, but they've been wrong century after century, decade after decade. The view is that the world is a terrible place and the world will be destroyed and be replaced by something else. And the assumptions of this view, when we think about it, is that the work of Jesus on the cross has failed. Sin is not defeated. The darkness has overwhelmed the light and we need to wipe everything out and start all over again. Now, this viewpoint not only brushes aside the ethical and moral teachings of Jesus as they are found in the Gospels, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the parables, but it also actually pushes aside the atonement, the work of Jesus on the cross, the shedding of his blood that our sins might be removed. Now, a more traditional eschatological view that uh, prevailed for centuries in the Christian church is that the gospel will spread. The influence of the way of life of Jesus and his gospel will expand across the world, and Jesus will return not with a blast of destructiveness, but with the coming of the peaceable realm of God. The advance of the gospel is the work of the church. That is our job. That is what Jesus told us to do, to go forth and proclaim the gospel, that God sent his Son into the world, that he was born of the Virgin Mary. He taught us, and he gave us a gospel of life that is articulated clearly in the pages of the New Testament. We are sent out to repair the world, to bind up the injured, to feed the hungry, and to do all the other kinds of things that Jesus did in his ministry. The prophet Isaiah speaks of the day of the Lord in his prophecy, chapter 62, verses 1 through the first part of verse 4. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or your name be called desolate, but you will be called Hepzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you. The nations and the peoples of the world will come to the Lord, and we have the assignment to take that gospel forth into the world. One of my favorite Christmas albums is by Jethro Tull. English group came out about 20 years ago. I know some people would say it's not appropriate for a minister to be listening to Jethro Tull, but I've always liked that Christmas album. And they have a line in one of the songs, How many wars are you fighting out there this winter morning? Maybe. It's always time for another Christmas song. The wars continue, but we continue uh, to celebrate, but we have an assignment. Do we want to live in a land that is desolate and deserted, a place of abandonment and hopelessness? We look at Gaza, we look at the Ukraine, this day at the end of 2023, desolate and abandoned. The world tonight is a place where the henchmen of Herod prowl as they do. The slaughter of the innocents, the proclamation of lies, goes on this very day. Korean poet Ku Sang, who was a Christian, wrote a poem in which he says these words, Herod and his henchmen keep watch, ready to lop off the young shoots. And your disciples, changing the color of the gospel. That's being done today. That's being done. Did we change the color of the gospel? Just this week, I heard a Christian leader call for the elimination, the killing of all Palestinians. No innocents, even the little children. They all deserve to die. Is that what Jesus would say? But our job is to proclaim the message that the light has shined, that Jesus has been born. The year 2024 begins in just a couple of days. May this be a year in which we, the followers of Christ, obey and follow what Jesus has taught us. Let me close by reading a brief part of the Christmas proclamation of St. Isaac of Nineveh, the great saint of the Nestorian Church. This is his Christmas proclamation, just the first part of it. This night, Christmas bestowed peace on the whole world. Let no one fret it. This is the night of the most gentle. Let no one be cruel. This is the night of the humble one. 
let no one be proud. Now is the day of joy, let us not revenge. Now is the day of good will, let us not be mean. In this day of peace, let us not be conquered by anger. There's a good program for us as Christians to follow in the new year. Let us listen to the word of the Lord. He who has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. We invite you to visit our church website at cpctoranum.org to learn more about our ministries. You can also visit us on Facebook at Central Presbyterian Church Tarenum. Please join us as we renew lives, inspire hope, and serve others. God bless you.